time to discuss international football headlines with focus on the fixtures of the weekend as far as European leagues are concerned. A very good afternoon and welcome back to the show. My name is Maxwell Wasike. It's the fan zone and Sam Gitahi, the Man United supporter, is joining us as, and so is Fred Openda, <laughs> an Arsenal diehard and he's been missing in action. Good to see you, Fred. How have you been? I've been good. Uh, up and down, of course, Shukuli uh, Maisha. I'm back now. I'm happy to be around. And Sam Gitai, yourself, how are you? You are all right? Yeah, I'm doing good. Just focusing on everything that's been happening in our country, especially basketball, the conversation we had in there, and football, of course, with the Champions League now back, and the Europa League and Manchester United flying off with a very good win against Real Sociedad. United are so much into talking big about <laughs> small wins, especially on Thursday night football, where no one minds watching such competitions. Of course, they beat Real Sociedad 4-0, and Bruno Fernandes was on the score sheet. And of course, we will talk about the impact and influence of Bruno Fernandes since he joined United from Sporting Lisbon. But right about now, of course, our feature game this particular weekend is Arsenal against Manchester City. Menti meeting against Ment. Of course, we're talking about, you know, uh, Mikel Arteta locking horns against a person he grew in his wings as his assistant manager. That is Pep Guardiola of Manchester City. And how about you get into our social media handles and uh, submit uh, your thoughts and insights with regards to that particular game and what do you think might be the outcome of the clash? Hashtag touchline Y254 Y254 channel at Wasika Maxwell. Fred Okenda, Arsenal up against Manchester City. A big task, of course. Uh, those are uh, and it's, don't it's tell us you are hopeful because you are not putting on a jersey. Okay, you are scared <laughs> of the outcome. I'm, <laughs> not, I'm, I'm not really scared of the outcome uh, because right now, uh, when you look at uh, uh, a city on a 12 uh, game run, winning run, then uh, you know you you know it's a tall order for Arsenal. They have not lost at the Emirates uh, since December 2015. Uh, where they lost 2-1 uh, against uh, Arsene Wenger. Uh, when you look at the Arsenal team right now, uh, of course, they are a work, a work in progress. They are improving uh, with the results. Uh, we've been unbeaten at home for the last six uh, matches, winning three of those and drawing three. Uh, but now coming against uh, City, who are uh, at, at the top of the table right now, point, 10 points clear, it becomes a a big challenge, as uh, uh, Arteta just said the other day, that you know, it gives us a platform to show, showcase what we've been achieving uh, in recent games. We've been doing well, uh, and I think tomorrow gives us a platform. But it's at all order, you know. I'm looking forward to hearing from my good friend, Engineer Silas Kinoti, the Director General of Kenya Urban Roads Authorities, a diehard and ardent support of Arsenal. And I know despite his workaholic schedule, I know he might be watching the show and just hoping to get his thoughts on that particular game. Of course, he's an objective fan who believes that, you know, if things are thick, he can <laughs> as well throw in the towel <laughs> very early. <laughs> so, <laughs> some guitar, yeah. you know, there are those supporters who are not objective. They go with, them, with the heart, not the head. <laughs> you see you are at an objective. <laughs> Actually, I was talking about you. Okay. <laughs> okay, no. Talking about this match and talking about Manchester City, the last time I was here, we were with Joe Saina, and I was actually telling that Manchester City are winning this league by far. Well, himself, being an objective, he said that, of course, Manchester United are going to get back to this. But then, it's been 16 games, actually, for Manchester City, unbeaten. And then you go back to all competitions, it's been around 24 matches. My goodness. They have considered, I guess, six goals in as many matches they've played. And they look good. Doesn't matter the combination they go for. The back line can go with John Stones, who looks very good right now. Diaz, they can go also with the Laporte, whom we saw last weekend play. Uh, even against Everton, he did play in that match. In the middle of the pack, KDB was out for that period. And they still won their matches with Gundogan in there. And Ilke Gundogan is so rejuvenated, man. Yeah. Despite his age, he's been, you know, marshalling that pack yeah. very well. And I was actually looking at his stats. The amount of goals he scored so far this season, I guess even in eight matches, is more than he scored in the last two seasons combined. Actually, he's, he's the top scorer in, 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 in Manchester City. Months. Yeah. The last month is the top scorer in the league. So he's so been he's in his calling right now. So actually, the way he's anchoring that midfield, 
actually gives them uh, an edge. And then when you look at uh, the wing, the, the young guy in Zichenko, I, I think they're really having a good combination. Remember Raheem Sterling, uh, he's been phenomenal against Arsenal. Uh, actually, in, uh, he's, in the last six matches, he's had as uh, created uh, around two, two uh, uh, given two assists, uh, scoring four goals against Arsenal. So I think uh, he's going to start that game tomorrow. And uh, you will see, of course, uh, the free scoring midfielder in Gandagan. And then we have the young man in Zichengo, performing really well. So uh, I'm hoping to, to see, uh, and you see the, the good thing. Zinchenko was a left back. Yeah, yeah. now he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a winger and he's performing in that role. I, I think uh, sometimes uh, there is a time uh, Guardiola deploys uh, him at the left back position uh, when Mendy is not playing. So I think uh, we have Kerani uh, Tine back who's going to be number one in that uh, team sheet, uh, leaving out uh, Leno. Uh, I think he will have a tough time, but he's capable. All right, so, what he can do. so maybe a question to you, because I, mm -hmm. I, I watched that game against Leeds United mm -hmm. for Arsenal, and when Pierre America Bomeyang scored that hat trick, not yes. that goal, mm -hmm. the camera somehow panned to Ari Alexander Lacazette yeah. on the bench, and yeah. he was there just uh -huh. clapping. But I know deep down he was questioning himself, and like, this man has been out for a period of time, comes on, banks a hat trick, and I'm here on the bench. The first hat trick in the Premier League. Yeah, do you see any chance that Lacazette will start in this match now? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing a, a situation whereby uh, uh, Arteta is going to go for experience. Uh, he will uh, definitely uh, deploy uh, both Pierre Emerick Aubameyang and uh, Lacazette. Lacazette slotting in, uh, in the number nine position and then uh, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang cutting in from the, the, the left. We have the young uh, guy, uh, Emil uh, Smith Rowe, who has been phenomenal uh, since December. So I think he'll slot in uh, at, at the number 10 position. And then when you look at uh, uh, Martin Odegaard, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's coming from Real Madrid, he's, he's actually uh, performed really well in the games that he has played. Yeah. But uh, because of trying to have that experience, uh, uh, slotting uh, uh, Lacazette into the uh, first 11, then Odegaard might, might lose his place in the starting 11. But I know at some juncture in the game, maybe in the second half, uh, around the 60th minute, depending on the, uh, on, the, on the progress of the game, he will be able to come in and uh, give his input. Uh, Pepe has, been, uh, has really improved in the past few, uh, few matches. I, I, I see a uh, point where he, he might come from the right now. You have the Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. We have uh, Lacazette at uh, the number nine position, and then we, we have Pepe uh, on the other wing. So I, uh, that's, that's the, the front uh, four that I can see for now, unless we have... Uh, Why are you excluding Willian when uh, you know very well that no. United has got some top <laughs> spot for Willian? <laughs> the I, aging Willian. I, I, I don't know, my my I, biggest question with you talking about those players, yes. you've left out your most influential player, the one who's at least carrying the team right now, watched him against Benfica. Y yes, Bukayo scoring Saka. his goal. What's yeah, Bukayo Saka in that line? Now, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to look as, uh, at a position whereby, you know, we we'd mention, uh, mentioned that Kieran Tierney has come back in. I, I don't know whether uh, Ateta will go with a back four, or, uh, of course, with the three uh, central <coughs> defenders. Mm. Uh, Bukayo Saka has been phenomenal. Yeah. And we have really, he's been actually the one carrying the team. Yeah, he's uh, your Bruno Fernandes. Uh, yes. Now, uh, the front, uh, actually, we look very good going up front. Mm -hmm. The problem is now that anchor midfield. Yeah. We'll go, we, 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 we have Shaka, who is also not bad right now. But the problem is our super signing uh, Th uh, Thomas Pate is will be missing with a hamstring injury mm -hmm. we have not really got to see a glimpse of him playing like uh, four, four games uh, consecutive four games uh, so that uh, we can really try to measure but when he's playing uh, he's really good so we'll be missing him so of course I, I'll, I'll see Xhaka uh, maybe slotting alongside uh, Ceballos again mm -hmm. uh, for, for that game or maybe you might see uh, Ateta bringing in uh, the Egyptian. So, uh, El Neni. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, for now, going up front, the problem is uh, Bellerina has not been good, yeah. but he's trying. Uh, I would uh, love to see uh, holding back in the starting 11 uh, alongside uh, Magalis. And then, if we are going with the back four, uh, of course, TNA. 
uh, slotting the left back foot. And again, you talking know, about the left say if, mm. if wishes were, <laughs> <laughs> horses, yeah. yes. you see, whatever he's trying to speculate is not. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's trying his best to at least not line what up Mikel a bit. Arteta will do because I know Mikel Arteta <laughs> will start with David Lewis in the defense. <laughs> no. Yeah, but uh, but again, his point was good. Maybe he could start with the back three because holding his back. Yes. Now they've got Gabriel and Lewis. Maybe they could start at the back. But I, they, I think it's also important to talk about the Manchester City goalkeeper Ederson. He's been money so far. Yeah. Last game, I thought maybe he would have been given the penalty that they had with Pep Guardiola talking about him being the, pen, the best the penalty taker, taker they have. <laughs> and then he took it personally and decided to give a very good assist to Gundogan. So he's a very good player and maybe you'll want to see what Brazil do with him because Alisson on the other end, he's been horrible. Actually, in the past, uh, recent past, he's been horrible, horrible. And I'm, I'm looking at that game against Everton. If he's going to perform the way he's, he's been performing, then they'll concede some goals. Talking about Everton against Liverpool, that is a massive side that you've seen in the past. When you were watching English Premier League football, man, it was flames watching Liverpool against Everton. You couldn't predict and speculate, you know, the likely outcome of that particular clash. But nowadays, it's one-sided affair. It's never and no longer two-way traffic. You can just say, come on, Liverpool is going to win. <laughs> to win the game. <laughs> so, today, I think it's late kickoff time. Mm -hmm. Liverpool up against Everton. What can we expect? Alisson has been in horrible form, yes. But of course we can see, you know, the coming back of, you know. Against Leipzig. Uh, the defense duo of Liverpool. I think that they've been out injured and they look like they're recovering very well. Yeah. Joe Gomez and, and Van Dijk. Uh, Van Dijk. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How, how, how much influence will they to Liverpool, to Jurgen Klopp's charges against of course, of Come course, on, when you look at the injuries that Liverpool have had this season, actually, they have really affected, actually, uh, the, the season very, when, when they lost Van Dijk uh, to a horrible injury. It was in this match, the Goodison game, when exactly. they played against Everton, where yes. they lost Van Dijk. So, so mm -hmm. I think uh, them coming back uh, will really help them. When you look at the table, uh, right now... Can we attribute the slope of Liverpool to the absence? Not only that, they have lots of issues affecting them because, yes, that's a very good reason. But again, you'll ask why they didn't sign a centre back while well, they just let Lovren go out to Zenit St. Petersburg. They could have signed another replacement the in there. The best defender in the world. <laughs> yeah, maybe they could have at least signed another centre back in that position. And after even losing Van Dijk and losing all the other players, it took them 31 days for them to sign another centre back and they signed Ben Davies signing Oz and Kabak, while they still had Nathaniel Phillips and Rhys Williams on the bench who weren't starting. So maybe even you should question why Jürgen Klopp hasn't been using the defenders in the team. And he's been you're using them in the midfielders. Midfield and every so. time you play Henderson and Fabinho in, in your defence, you're losing two players in the midfield. And that has clearly affected their midfield with Thiago coming in. He's not the best player yet. So lots of issues you could at least contribute to why Liverpool are struggling this So season. you ought to have stuck with the second choice defenders and you know continue deploying Henderson and yeah, Gigi I think in the midfield in the yeah, I think where they used to play. Yeah, I think it would have been better, especially for Rhys Williams. For Nathalie and Phillips, I think he had a very tough run in at that time. He had few errors in him. But again, that thing about signing defenders is the one on my list because at the summer they could have just brought in the centre back and everything would have been better for them. You know, <laughs> Everton are quite unpredictable. I was watching the against Man United when they came from behind to oh, oh, all Red Devils 3 all. And yeah. you know that Calvert Lewin's late winner, mm -hmm. come on, was something else. And you know, the upfront combination, the attacking department has been doing very well. You know, uh, the Brazilian Tolman. Yeah, James. And uh, also the Colombian international man. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Calvert Hames, Lewin. Lewin. So the, the trio has been you know, working well in partnership. And I don't know how key is that combination to ensure that they pick three maximum points against their traditional opponents? I think, uh, okay, in the first place, three points might be uh, a tall order for them uh, at Anfield. Uh, but when you look at uh, the performance of Calvin Lewin and James Rodriguez, those are the, the two uh, frontmen that I'm expecting to... Obviously, to Richardson also will start... Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he might be coming in from the wing. So I think this, uh, the trio of Richardson, uh, Calvin Lewin, and uh, Hamid yes, are gonna decide whether Liver, uh, whether Liverpool are gonna be put in for a sword 
or uh, maybe uh, they lose. If they are going uh, gonna to uh, score goals, then I think Liverpool, the shaky defending that they have had before, uh, starting from the goalkeeper coming to their back lane, uh, they are going to cause them problems. Uh, and we might be seeing a lot of goals uh, in this, in this uh, match because I'm expecting uh, to see uh, maybe uh, Calvin Lewin getting on the score sheet uh, if he's going to continue with, the, with, with his run. And maybe uh, the three of uh, uh, Sadio, uh, Salah, and, uh, Firmino. and Firmino also. Although Firmino, maybe Salah and, uh, and uh, who? And Jurgen Klopp criticized, you know, <laughs> uh, a section of football supporters for failing to give credits to Mo Salah. Deserving credits, he deserves saying that mm -hmm. he's been of much <laughs> importance to them. I don't know. Nowadays, you can go play <laughs> playing mental tricks. You know, it's 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 all about their performance. You know, when you are not performing, uh, then you, you you try to find out. Uh, as, as those are non issues for me. You don't you don't expect fans to come out uh, to give credit. Let the player perform on the pitch, and and that says says credit is earned. Exactly, you earn it, and you don't expect fans to come uh, and uh, give you credit, especially right now that we are playing under uh, behind closed doors. So for now, uh, it's all about uh, uh, Salah performing, and that that's what matters. Chelsea okay. against. No, wait, wait, first, before I uh, let me just talk about that match between Everton and Liverpool. I was looking at the stats, and it's been 22 years since Everton last won at Anfield. Mm -hmm. Actually, was not born at that time. But <laughs> uh, looking at how Liverpool have been performing at Anfield, they've lost three consecutive games at a place where they had already called it a, a stronghold in their, in, their, in their own backyard. And looking at this match, I guess also it's a very big conversation about the goalkeepers too. Because Pickford did a very bad error against Manchester City in that game. And many questioning maybe if we could see Olsen back in the team. Alisson, we also what happened at Leicester City uh, with his error, I could say. Because he had a, a, a difficult time with Ozan Kaa back in there. Um, it's going to be interesting because Everton lost Sierra Mina in the, in the game against Manchester City. So I see a situation where maybe they are going to bring back uh, the Locadine. And then you're going to have the likes of Michael Keane, Mason Holgate, Ben Godfrey all playing in that game. So it's going to be an interesting game. But the, uh, Everton should look at this match and feel like we should get a win here. Definitely. Let's go to what is about to kick off in the next few minutes, Chelsea, mm. against Southampton. Since, you know, the big man from Paris Saint-Germain yeah, took over, mm. man, they have been <laughs> in form of their life. <laughs> and come on, they have been performing very well. I, they had to record even a single defeat since yeah. Yeah. he took charge after the sacking of Frank Lampard. Yeah, I guess we, we don't have much to say about his selection because we have not seen him go with a, a, spe a, a particular lineup because he's been changing once and you, you see uh, Dominic, you see the, this lad in uh, Kalomazo not doing one game, the other day you see Chilwell, the other day you see Alonso. I guess we haven't really get, got much from what he needs from his team. We saw Kepa is a Balaga starting the other match. But I guess looking at how they are playing, it's been a very good possession game. They are possessing in almost 69.1% average. But I guess they have still not meant met a very big team so far. But I think it if there are two players he's stuck with yeah. who are getting bent by Frank Lampard yeah. are, you know, the, the left Robert backs, Jets. even yeah. uh, you know, Marcos Alonso and yeah. even Caesars Bilqueta and even in the midfield he's yeah, been Jorginho. partnering Jorginho and Kovacic. Kovacic. Yeah, and I was looking at some of the players that um, might have now lost their place at Chelsea because you're looking at Chilwell, he's already lost that place against Alonso. Then you look at the centre back. You Where is Ngolo Kante? Yeah. Yeah, actually, he's starting. The of the he's starting. The team is are in. Yes. Uh, we start with Mendy, we have as Bikueta, Rudiga, Zuma, James, Kovacic, Kante, Alonso, Mount, Abram. And, and come on, Rudiga, you game. remember <laughs> how Rudiga was being accused and criticized for, you know, bad influence in the dressing room, a uh, move that might have led to, you know, the firing of Frank Lampard. Frank Lampard. Mm -hmm. And how that man had <coughs> fallen down on the pecking order of Chelsea Football Club during the times of Frank Lampard and now he's commanding a starting place. And actually there's a Twitter account that has been 
meant for him. They are counting down the days to when his contract expires at Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, I guess it's the German effect, really, because Thomas Jukel comes in and all of a sudden you see Rudiger in the team, you see Timo Werner now starting <laughs> every game. Yeah. The only guy left in there has been Kai Havert, so uh, it's a very good lineup. I really didn't expect, actually, Tammy Abraham to be back in this game because he picked up an injury. Yeah. But then seeing Katsuma again is, is impressive, so... Yeah. I think they are still going to win this because Southampton have been on a bad roll. Six consecutive defeats for them. And now, I don't, I don't know whether there's any manager who gets the credit even after losing 9 nil in two consecutive seasons like Rafa Senulfin has done. He's lost six consecutive games and no one is talking he about him really. Him, right? yeah, so <laughs> I think another player we need to give a mention who has not been getting played under Tuchel is Hakim Ziyech. You remember the mm. hype when he was getting signed from Ajax Amsterdam? Yeah. I, think, I think the problem which uh, Chelsea are facing uh, concerning Ziyech is that they signed too many Players they in the same not, position. Uh, yeah, in the same position. They did not uh, need to sign the edge with all, uh, all that amount of money. And these are the, the things actually which have led uh, uh, to Frank Lambert being fired because he spent over 200 uh, million signing players and they cannot perform. So uh, seeing uh, the edge uh, not in, uh, in the team, it's because of the quality that they have. They have yeah. a lot of players in that position. So he has to wait for his chance. Uh, there are many uh, competitions uh, Chelsea are involved in, so he will wait for his chance. Once he gets it, then the, the, he the first leg of it, this game ended 3 all, and I think yeah, I remember it was watching a horror it. show by Kepa. <laughs> 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 it's a really horror show there. And but, you know, yeah. Southampton has got these players who've been loyal to this club mm -hmm. for uh, quite long. Mm -hmm. Like Oriel Romeo is starting again, and much. remember, he's yes. a former player for. Chelsea, Chil I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yes. Ryan Bertrand yeah. he's yeah. been James so Prose. loyal. <laughs> and when you go to the midfield, James Prose you have Ward Prowse. Ward Prowse yeah. in there. And come on. And Stuart Armstrong. Yeah. So, I don't know. Their striking uh, department has been revolving around this one man. Yeah, Danny Ings. Who banged in several goals last season. Danny Ings, who is yet to get a call up to the England national team despite the overwhelming pressure. I don't know. Do you think that can give, him, can give them an edge? Uh, okay, uh, looking at the run of Chelsea, the recent run, uh, they love a problem, but remember this is a team, uh, Southampton, which pops up at any time and they can score goals. Uh, you're talking about Ings. So I, I think f it's, it's all about f uh, for them uh, to leave Chelsea the, uh, play their game, the, the, the possession game, wait for counter-attacks and maybe they'll be able to nick a goal or two uh, and give Chelsea problems. I guess looking at all the matches that Chelsea has played and uh, Thomas Tuchel, you've not seen them actually get that pressure from teams because every team they've played so far, the likes of Burnley's and Sheffield United and even Spurs, all of them have been applying some low blocks in there. So Chelsea has had all the time to possess the game and build the game into their own house. So maybe Southampton want to do something different, try and attack them, try and put in some pressure on them, press, which Rafa Senhalton knows how to do it. We saw him do against Liverpool. So maybe I guess that could be the key. And I know they have some fast runners in the team. It's slowly getting back to a, a very normal team for, for Southampton because they lacked some guys like Yannick Pestergaard in the team. Now they're getting back, only that they had a blow with Kyle Walker-Peters getting another injury in that team. I think when you look at the Chelsea uh, uh, lineup. Having Kovacic in that midfield and Kante, Kante maybe might be sitting uh, low and Sometimes he, he might go uh, uh, forward, but uh, as we are saying, uh, that uh, Chelsea game of possession, it's all about uh, uh, Southampton employing a, a low block and waiting for their chances. Mm -hmm. Because if they are going to attack Chelsea, they are going to consider a lot. A ex exactly, they are going to consider a lot of goals, especially when you have Mount uh, and Wana that speed. Then Definitely, they have of a course, the matches lined up this particular afternoon as far as European leagues are concerned. A lot of matches I am marked to take place, but we're just being specific on uh, a few individual games and a feature one being Arsenal up against Manchester City set for tomorrow. Super Sunday it is, and you can also join the conversation and be part of the program. Tell us, what is your expectation with regard to that particular clash? Can the mentee, uh, you know, pull a surprise against the mentor? That's Mikel Arteta who lived in the wings of you know, Pep Guardiola as his assistant at Manchester City, now in charge of Arsenal, and they will be locking horns against each other tomorrow. How will that pan out talk to us? Hashtag touchline Y254, Y254 channel at Wasike Maxwell. Remember, a lot of headlines, one of them also being you know, Thierry Henry, the 
World Cup winner, Champions League winner, man who had an accomplished football career. And of course, he's been having rough times as a manager. He's failed to translate his glittering football career, failing to replicate it in his managerial career. Now, getting approached by Bournemouth, mm. who are playing in Skybet Championship, will he leave Montreal Impact? Where this is the our thing. very own Victor Onyama plays? So this is the thing. I was on Thursday listening to a, a football show that had Bournemouth supporters calling in for, the, for that show. And the question was, are you taking Thierry Henley as your manager? And all of them were like, no, 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 everyone no. Why? <laughs> the reason is this, right? They had a very long period when they had Eddie Hoy in that, in that team and they performed quite well, only that they were... I love Eddie Hoy. Yeah, he stayed there for a long time as a player and now as a manager, only that they fell back to the championship. And looking at, at the journey after that, it has been Jason Tindall who came with the team and they struggled a little bit and now they have settled in with Jonathan Woodgate on an interim basis. Looking at Jonathan Woodgate's few matches when he's been there, they've won all and he's taken them to the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. They look pretty good. We see some players in that team who have really improved, like Stanislas, who now looks like a very good player. And I guess today are they're they in good shape to earn a promotion. Not yet. There's still a huge gap between themselves and Swansea, Norwich, and Brentford. Do look like they are still going to be among in the top two. So maybe they could sneak into that pro promotion playoff zone. But looking at the job that Jonathan Woodgate has done for that team so far, it is a brilliant job and. Many people are looking at this game they will be playing later tonight against Queen's Park Rangers. They are the idea that maybe if he wins, he could earn himself an interview. But Thierry Henry has not been the only manager who's been interviewed for that post. There's also been the talks of a guy like Dick Advocat, who's now at Firewood, who could be a potential manager for the team. The likes of Patrick Vieira, too, being mentioned. Frank Lampard, I believe, is not on the same trajectory as coming back into the championship after losing his job at Chelsea. At the same time, we've had even Harry Redknapp, a man who's uh, a love of Bournemouth because I see him every time when Bournemouth are playing, being called there for the job. So Thierry Henry, to me, I guess he's not yet proved a lot uh, in the English game. And now you're coming into a championship where you only know there's only one route to the, to the Premier League. You need to win games. And looking at the pressure in the English media, I don't think that Thierry Henry is the man there. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can start uh, by saying that, you know, as a club legend uh, for Arsenal, he performed very well as a player. That earned him uh, a position at Monaco. You know, you, you saw the, the results, and doesn't, that doesn't mean that when you, play, you played so well in your career, you'll come in and be a very good coach. Uh, for now, uh, I think his position at Montreal Impact, it, it, there's no pressure as compared uh, as uh, he's saying, there's no pressure in, in the Major League Soccer as compared uh, to the English game. For him, would be better uh, staying at Montreal for the time being. But if he comes fine and well, uh, we've seen uh, legends coming in. Uh, we have seen Lombard, he did very well in the championship. Mm. We've seen Rooney take uh, a job at uh, Derby. Yeah. So I think uh, if he comes, then let's give him a space. But with that pressure of the, uh, the English media and all that, and the performance, the performance that is, is needed, and especially that now Bournemouth have been the uh, EPL, uh, they will need to get back into the EPL, uh, back from the championship. He will need to win games, but he is, is going to come back and perform the Monaco style. He will not even live up to the end of the season. Wow. Yeah. And mm -hmm. again, a, a lot of stories indeed. And of <laughs> course, tomorrow there is also a Milan derby, AC against Inter, and you saw what happened <laughs> <laughs> between <laughs> Romelu Italian. Lukaku yeah. and you know, Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Both yeah. former teammates at Man United clashing against each other, but we saw the apology being issued uh, later on after that particular game. So tomorrow, are we set to see another, you know, gigantic clash between <laughs> the two <laughs> heavyweights and especially coming from a man who brags over being a f the best footballer in the world. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's going to be an interesting one because now you're looking at the Serie A table. You've got Inter Milan on top and then AC Milan who've been on top for the, the whole part of this season and now they've just slumped against Spezia last weekend. Again, we saw them even in the Europa League, they drew against Renas Vesda. Mm -hmm. They have somehow crumbled a little bit, but looking at the drop they've had for the Serie A title, Inter, you go back to 2010 when they last won the title, AC Milan, you go back to 2011. I guess it's going to be a big fight in this one. Yeah, uh, actually, is, is Ibrahim going to play in that game? Yeah, he is. 
Okay, we will it will be an interesting game uh, being so a derby. Tomorrow is a super Sunday. <laughs> yeah, of course. We will be treated to some interesting uh, and football. Yeah. football <laughs> games. So another you know development is Wilfred Zaha the Crystal Palace striker saying mm. that he will not take the knee. Take the knee mm-hmm. going forward <laughs> as a way of you know fighting, you know, the vice of of you know Precision. racial discrimination and abuse because it is something that has been sort of a standard practice being practiced by players across the board as one way of you know trying to combat this monster but nothing is happening is happening is just <laughs> you know this comes down to individuals and uh, you know everyone has his own uh, you know position on on issues if he doesn't want to have to go down then fine but he's justified to ask questions because why do something that is not uh, bearing fruits if it's not bearing fruits then we find another way kneeling down is not bearing fr- fruits we have to come uh, together as uh, stakeholders the players the management and the fans as well i think if, yeah. I, if i were a football <laughs> administrator in europe i would have proposed docking of points that is yeah a something good like that <laughs> measure, measure. Uh, yeah because the fans the supporters of a certain club will feel the pinch yes of, and you know, and stop such vices points. yes after them getting involved in racial abuse we saw what happened to you know uh, this player of Man United, the Rashford. defender who's been costing them. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> Twanzebe. Yeah. Twanzebe. Uh, yeah. Sell Twanzebe. <laughs> and, you know, even uh, at some point, Anton Martial yeah, even Rashford abused because abuse, you know. of his, uh, you know, yeah. game. Yeah, and actually even yesterday, William posted some screenshots about the abuse he's been getting online. But again, talking about the taking of the knee, um, Brentford last weekend, they released a statement saying that they are not going to take the knee any longer, that they are, sta- they are going to stand, but they are still going to respect the opponent's decision to take a knee. Liz, uh, w- watching what Wilfred Zaha told the media about players being used as puppets right now to take a knee while nothing is being done out there, I guess it was a big statement, and I agree with him because it comes a time when the message is watered down. Mm-hmm. And you remember when after the, the, the bubble came in when the season was ending, they brought in the Black Lives Matter campaign. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was watered down to become no racism, no room for racism. I guess in that point, the gravity of the matter was watered down a little bit and many people didn't take it as seriously as it was supposed to be. So looking forward, we've seen Instagram do some major modifications on their platform. They have now gone an extra step of actually banning some of the fans Accounts, who are coming yeah. out to at least uh, criticize some of the players through their color. And again, Twitter has been another place where I think the abuse has been vile. So maybe they are looking at ways in which they could uh, at least ban these words that are being used and even some of the emojis because these are things that can be done by social media platforms. So. Going forward, I believe it's going to be something to be done with everything going over and at the top because even the representation in the league has been poor. I think, uh, as you are saying, uh, when when all the stakeholders come in, especially uh, the social media handles where the abuses are vile, you know, banning some of these uh, words, as you are saying, actually going even uh, further actually to ban some to, to, to ban some of the accounts completely uh, mm-hmm. would be a very good move and as uh, sometime back I think when we we started this discussion uh, there was an issue of of, of, of of dropping points if if fans of a certain team are, are, are abusing or in the stadium that is we, we could have a, a, a point deduction program whereby uh, teams will feel the pinch and we could we could also go uh, a, a little uh, bit further whereby those fans in the stadiums throw uh, insulting words uh, at players and all that ban them for life from the stadiums definitely you know when I was growing up I used to uh, I wanted to become a pastor and my <laughs> love for church is still unwavering that's why you can mic. see <laughs> holding this mic in my hand. Of course, due to technical hitches, I had to take some guitars. Uh, and uh, just to wind up the show, of course, it's been a pleasure doing this from 1 to 3 o'clock every Saturday. We on Touchline is always the show. Let's continue with this conversation. What's popping up as far as matter sports is concerned? A lot is happening, just like we indicated to you when we were kicking off the program at Nyai National Stadium. It's the Sisimuka Charity Cup between Kenya and uh, 
Alequins against Cabras RFC in what looks like a cut and raiser for the upcoming Kenya Cup campaign, which starts next weekend on 27th. Also, Kenya will be playing against Portugal during the Madrid Invitational Rugby Tournament, and Lionesses as well also will be opening up their campaign later on tonight. And of course, it's a packed up schedule as far as matter sports is concerned. Kenya Morans, the national basketball uh, team, will also be playing against Angola in their second game of the 2021 Afro Basketball qualifiers and they would need to win that particular match to boost their chances of making it to the main tournament. It's been a pleasure doing this guys. Keep safe. Have a fantastic weekend and of course to my panelists, the two gentlemen Fredo Penn and Sam Gitai. Always a pleasure and thanks for them to come through to dissect what is happening and what is expected to happen with regards to the upcoming matches. Of course, Arsenal supporters, you are in my prayers as well. Good afternoon <laughs> and God bless you.